everyone. Thanks for joining us today. Um, my name is Jane Hu, and I'm a journalist and a contributor to Future Tense. Um, Future Tense is a collaboration between Arizona State University, New America, and Slate that examines emerging technologies, public policy, and society. I'll be moderating our conversation today, and I'm thrilled to be joined by Kevin Collier, who's a reporter at NBC News, Nimit Sani, who is the co-founder of Votes, and Larry Norden, who's the director of the Election Reform Program at the Brennan Center for Justice. So just a reminder, if you do have questions as we chat, please feel free to drop them in the tab below. Um, and so, yeah, voting is on everyone's mind at the moment. And this year with coronavirus, especially, more voters than ever are trying mail-in ballots or voting early. And as we're talking about um, alternatives to our usual voting methods, um, so and so many things have moved online, a lot of people are asking, will voting become digital as well? So I wanna kick off the conversation by asking, why would we even want online voting? Um, and I'll say that my bias is um, from, coming from Seattle, Washington, where we have a robust um, mail-in ballot system and the process is already quite easy. Um, I'm just curious what the conversation has looked like around why we would need this kind of technology. I can field that or start off. I think the appeal is enormous. I mean, in theory, uh, it's largely been um, attempted in this country uh, for you know military um, deployed service members, or um, you know it could be used for people with disabilities who. Uh, you know, don't have a lot of ease getting to the polls. Uh, I think it's been theorized with fairly convincingly that if we somehow had a robust online voting system, it would drastically increase voter participation. Uh, you know, the, the bigger question, of course, is how we actually would possibly get there. But I, I think it would likely really, you know, this country doesn't have really great numbers of um, people who actually show up on, on a given election day. And, you know, far more people are you know, engaged, I think, a vote for American Idol is, is the line than actually uh, vote in a given election. Yeah, I would, I would second what uh, Kevin just said. I think we also need to <clears throat> keep in mind that there are, there is a non-trivial number of voters who can't hand mark a paper ballot and who are not able to effectively use the postal ballot mail-in ballot system as well due to various uh, various constraints. And so we do need to keep them in mind. Also, there's a element of resiliency. If there is a natural disaster and we're going through a pandemic right now, we need to have backup plans, not just one, but several. And a digital solution um, provides that element of resiliency and you know protection against the worst case scenarios in addition provides access to voters who have traditionally been disenfranchised and can't use the traditional method of voting and elections are all about access <clears throat> so let's give uh, as much choice as we can to people in a in a responsible measured way and so that that's you know the big reason why we do need to keep exploring this so uh, maybe to keep things interesting, I'll push back a little bit. Uh, um, it, it's not, I, first of all, I should say, uh, you know, I, I work on um, voter access issues and um, it's always my uh, presumption that we wanna increase options for voters. So uh, if we could find a way to um, allow for internet voting that was secure, I, I, I think that would be great to be able to offer that option to voters. Um, it's not totally clear to me that that would really increase turnout. Um, uh, I, I, as I said, I think it's, it's, uh, it's critical to find ways to increase options for voters to increase um, um, access. Uh, but if you look at, um, you know, states that have more early voting, uh, states that have more vote by mail, you don't necessarily see um, huge increases in turnout. I think there are other issues around why um, we don't have the kind of turnout in the U.S. that many of us would like to see and that we see in other countries, which also, by the way, don't have internet voting. Um, so it's not clear to me that that is the key reason. 
Uh, at the same time, there's no question um, uh, that for some voters, um, in, in particular voters with disabilities, um, this might be a, a, a way to make it, uh, in particular for, for the challenges that they have, uh, easier to vote. Um, I think for the time being, and I'm sure that we'll get into this discussion, um, where uh, there's a pretty much universal opinion by security experts that we're not ready to, 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 to roll this kind of thing out, that we need to be looking for alternatives right now um, that can help uh, voters with disabilities, voters living abroad, to ensure that uh, they can vote and that their votes will get counted. Great, and we'll definitely come back to the issue of security. Um, but before we get into that, um, I wanted to kind of catch folks up in case they haven't been following this story very closely. So how close are we to having online voting? Like where has this happened already? And um, who's on the leading edge of this? So I can, I can address that. <clears throat> so as Kevin previously mentioned, currently <clears throat> several jurisdictions around the country have this option available to a very small group of voters, primarily deployed military personnel, um, US citizens who are living overseas, and in a small number of jurisdictions, voters who have uh, some form of a disability. So pilots uh, are happening across the country. Uh, and I believe more than 30 states do allow some form of electronic ballot return for this group of voters or, or a, a subset of, of voters. And some of those traditional methods have been uh, fax and email, none of which are you know, secure by you know, any, any standard. And so that's also something that needs to be kept in mind um, when we talk about security. So what does the actual process of voting on your phone or online look like? Like, do you have to log into something? Um, what, what does it look like from the user perspective? Sure, I'd be happy to take that, take that one too. Um, so there are, there are a couple of different approaches. The traditional approach has been to use some form of a website. And then our, the approach votes has been uh, piloting and pioneering is the use of a native smartphone application. From a voter's perspective, the initial process is the same uh, as you would do for any absentee voting process. So you register with your jurisdiction as an absentee voter. There's a, there's a federal form and then there's also a state specific form. So you can do either. Your county or uh, local city election clerk will do a little bit of vetting once you fill that information. And once they're satisfied, they, <clears throat> there's, there's an option on the form which, which method you want to choose. So you can choose uh, postal mail, you can choose uh, fax in some jurisdictions, and then you can choose electronic in some jurisdictions where you know, electronic options would be email or web or, or mobile, uh, wherever it's being piloted. And so you typically get an invitation and depending on the, on the channel, if it's mobile, you'd be asked to download an app do an initial uh, authentication using your mobile number and email that needs to match what you've provided to the county clerk. And then you're prompted to do a, a ID verification. So you have to take a picture of a government issued photo ID. You can use a driver's license, state ID or passport. And then you're asked to take a, a live video selfie where you blink your eyes, move your face so it knows it's, it's real. You're not taking a picture of another picture or picture of another video. It then tries to match you with the picture in your ID, make sure your ID is valid, uh, legitimate, looks at the, the holograms and the barcodes as well. And if everything's um, matching with the voter registration file, then <clears throat> your identity is digitized, stored on the phone in a secure location and locked with the help of a biometric credential, which will be a fingerprint, a face ID or, or a wearable. And then all the documents you've provided are deleted for privacy reasons. And at that point, you're ready to receive your ballot. So you then receive your mobile ballot on the phone. You can mark the ballot. Um, it's an accessible interface. So if you're disabled or need to blow up the forms, you could do that. And then once you're ready, you 
confirm your choices. Uh, many states would ask you to sign an affidavit. So you sign on the phone screen. That gets automatically transcribed on the affidavit, which is then compared by the elections clerk with the data on the state voter registration system. You then get ready to submit with your biometric credential. You get a receipt instantly. So you as a voter can, um, and the receipts uh, encrypted and password protected, which only you have access to. So you can quickly check. And it also has a identifier in it, which you can use to audit your vote. And in parallel, the jurisdiction gets a copy of your receipt, which then is used to do a pre-tabulation audit. And then on election day, a paper ballot is actually produced. So even though you're actually voting on the phone, it's actually generating a, a paper ballot just as if, if you would have handmuffed it. That's what's tabulated with the family voting system. And then in the background, we use a distributed ledger system as well. So every oval goes on a, on a blockchain-based network, which then facilitates a post-election audit where every oval marked on the phone is compared with every oval on the paper ballot and the data on the blockchain and to give uh, uh, assurance of uh, trust and transparency and also ensuring everything went through uh, without any tampering. So end to end, that's one of the ways it works right now. Great, yeah, we'll get back to some of the verification process as well, but I, get, I wanna go back to the user experience, um, especially because I know that there's been a lot of mistrust over the last few years, especially about phone security. Um, I'm curious what the conversation's been like um, from voters. Like, how do we make sure that voters feel secure in using the system? Um, I'm particularly curious to hear from Kevin, who I know has reported on this, and also Larry, who I know has been researching this. Uh, so I've talked to a number of people who have cast their ballots through votes, uh, Nimitz uh, system, and pretty much to a T, they all had some difficulty getting it set up and overall enjoyed the experience. Now, I think that's a distinct discussion from security concerns, but just purely in terms of figuring it out and liking it, they had a little trouble. You know, there's a couple of steps to it. You know, voting is not easy, period. Um, but then they did enjoy it. Uh, I don't know if you want to get get into the security issue as well, but I, I, I do think that there is enough of a, a a consensus among security experts that um, that's a much, much tougher nut to crack. Larry, do you have anything to add to that or should we get into the security issues? Yeah, I, I, I would add a couple of things. One is, uh, I think it's interesting if you look at um, polling on this, that in general, if you first just ask voters, like, would they like to be able to vote on their phones? Um, they will say yes. Um, but then if you mention Russia or, um, uh, security attacks or nation states potentially attacking our elections, those, nu those numbers plummet. Um, so, you know, I, I think most people when, when they're thinking about voting and when they go to vote aren't necessarily thinking about security. Um, but of course, that's a, a great concern. Um, and, and when you raise it with voters, it's a great concern to them as well. Um, and I, 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 it's, I think it's worth noting um, how, uh, how, the fact that we have moved so dramatically away from um, leaving aside the whole voting over the internet, um, moved dramatically away in this country, away from paperless voting systems uh, and how much movement there was, both because of um, uh, national security warnings, but also because there was a public desire to have a paper record that that voter has seen before it was cast, either filled out or, or the machine produced a record before the vote was cast and how important that is to people. We've gone from something like, even just in the past few years, in 2016, I think one in five voters was voting on a system that didn't have a, a voter verified paper record. And in this election, it will be 4%. You know, there's, been, there's just been a dramatic move away from this. And I think that's in part because uh, of these security concerns that have been raised. And if so, I can add uh, if I could add a couple of things, uh, things over there uh, quickly. Um, so we've, we've also seen a lot of surveys, um, some of which um, Larry was referring to. And um, a lot of the feedback, um, the, the jurisdictions which have 
piloted with, with us have seen is, yes, the, if you ask the first question, would, would people uh, want to vote on their phone or online, there is a majority opinion in favor. If you then ask them the question about the risks, people do get skeptical. And then if you follow up with a mechanism by which they could audit their vote, the number shoots up again. And so that to us is an early indicator that people are looking for a measure of trust and whether it's a handmark paper or something digital, I think that's something that, that shouldn't be overlooked as well. So let's just back up a little bit. Um, I know Larry mentioned uh, the, just the possibility of hacking or um, state interference with our elections. What are the major security risks, um, especially compared to traditional voting or mail-in voting? I think the the, the most alarming that, that I've uh, heard talking with security experts is the idea that um, an online voting system can create a essentially a central place where um, where, where ballots are cast. You know, um, a worst case scenario with a particular voting machine being hacked on election day means that uh, you know, like those votes would be spoiled. Um, if we're talking about a, a more centralized hub, you know, and I'm, I'm speaking in broad terms here. Uh, we're talking about you know every vote that was was uh, cast on that on election day or, or in the lead up to election day, uh, all being spoiled, which which is essentially like you know orders of magnitude more. Uh, and then furthermore, um, if there's not a paper record that you can do a a, a truly separate independent uh, recount, uh, you know that the, the the discrepancy might never be found or might not be found for months or years, which, you know, states have a couple weeks maybe to certify their election results. You know, uh, it, it, it varies by state law, but, you know, certainly everybody has to be for a presidential election, for instance, uh, settled long before between November and January when we swear in the next president. So, I mean, that's just, that's a greater nightmare scenario, I think, than, anything I can think of with uh, traditional paper voting. Yeah, and I, 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 that's a good example, uh, Kevin. <laughs> I would agree with that. That's a big concern. Um, there, there are also concerns, of course, about, you know, if you're voting from personal devices, what, how secure those devices are. And if there's a, if there's a malware attack that reaches all iPhones, um, everybody that's voting on their iPhone um, could potentially um, have uh, their vote impacted uh, and I do, I, I do think the, the point that Kevin just uh, brought up at the end about the record that the the paper record that the voter has filled out um, that uh, I, you know I know going into 2006 uh, to, into 2020 one of the things that I'm uh, I've got you know I think everybody has anxieties about this election but one of the things that makes me feel a lot better is that um, in all of the battleground states um, and as I said earlier you know 96 percent of the country. Um, if there's some kind of problem, if there's some kind of doubt, um, we'll be able to go back to that paper record that the voter uh, herself um, has filled out, has viewed, and has confirmed um, is as how she intended to vote, and that 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 should go a long way to resolving doubts uh, about the vote total. So there's both the the actual security risk, but also the perception. Um, and as we know all too well, that perception is incredibly important. Um, in ensuring that uh, that our democracy works. Uh, so a couple of things to, to add there, um, which, which Kevin mentioned. The whole idea of uh, having uh, a central store for all the votes. And so if you look at the designs of some of the, the mobile voting systems out there, that's something which, which has been addressed through the use of uh, distributed ledger technology. And generally, every jurisdiction in the US conducts, conducts its own election. So even if you were using the same system across multiple jurisdictions, the data would be logically separated. So there is no single place where somebody can come in and alter the votes. So that's, that's one. Uh, the second one is, um, 
there, there is a paper ballot being generated here. Um, the, the key difference here is that if you talk to a lot of voters, when I go vote in person, I have to I have to trust the existing system. I have to trust that the paper ballot I marked and deposited in the machine is not going to be actually you know thrown away or you know something bad's going to happen to it. And there are instances where that happens, however small or inconsequential they may be. And so when when people say that you know paper is the ultimate form of trust, that's not actually true. Here with the with some of the new technology methods, you literally get 100% assurance that not only did your absentee ballot make it, it was counted and tabulated. And I think um, that should not be overlooked, that technology now has a way to give us more trust than what we have in the existing system. Regarding perception, I agree. There is There are a lot of um, conflicting thoughts and you know narratives out there. So definitely that's something which trust, you know, builds over a period of time. And that's why it's really important to make sure that any new technology isn't rolled out overnight. It's a very slow, gradual, iterative process where you can test it out repeatedly, make sure everything's good, and then, you know, expand, expand access beyond the small group of people where it's currently being tested. I do so think it's, sorry, if I can, uh, Note here, um, the uh, you know there have been a couple studies of uh, uh, security papers on on votes. Um, the MIT one found um, that uh, votes a server uh, did would be able to control uh, the, the the total results if I understand that correctly. Uh, so there at least is you know uh, security researchers have disagree on that point. Yeah, and that's that's essentially a misunderstanding of, of the architecture of the system, and and you could correlate that kind of a, a threat with the existing in-person voting system as well. I have to trust, as a citizen, what's happening in the elections office, uh, what's happening behind the scenes, and if a malicious actor decides to throw away all my, you know, all the paper ballots, or we recently saw, you know arson with a, with a draw box in California, and those you know, 100 odd votes are never gonna be able to recover. People who voted don't even know if it That's was- not true. Or not. So, I mean, it's, it, the reality is similar threats exist in the in-person voting system as well. Um, it's ultimately, you know, there's, there's a perception that's created that that's foolproof. No, that system also has several threats uh, and so we, we shouldn't ignore those. And you know, no system's 100% perfect. I think if you have adequate controls, detection at every step, then you can minimize the risk to a level that the system becomes usable. And so that's what we need to focus on with a digital system, just like the same approach we follow with the in-person voting system as well. I, I, sorry, Jay, I just wanna, I don't want to come into the conversation, but I just wanted to mention it. Is, you know, um, the the California example is is, is not the, that instance where it with the Dropbox they, they empty they empty Dropboxes regularly in California. They generally have video cameras. They, there are barcodes on the on the paper ballots, so they're able to contact people. You know, the the barcode keeps track of the ballots as it goes. They're able to contact people whose um, ballots may have been been lost, in, and, and obviously that's an exceptional circumstance. So you're talking about um, limited impact with that kind of attack uh, and an ability to recover. Uh, that I think um, we have, we still have a lot of questions about um, uh, for the examples that that Kevin or I, I gave about how you might recover from those attacks, and we have a lot of experience with voting on paper and with security measures around paper. Um, and, and have built in a lot of resiliency in those systems to ensure that if there are problems, we're able um, to recover and that we minimize problems. And one of my concerns, um, I, I have this concern generally because there are not enough standards and regulation, I, I, I think, and, and oversight in our election systems, but we really don't have any standard national, we don't, I mean, I shouldn't say 
we don't have any national standards uh, um, for, for internet voting. So um, we have private vendors who are selling um, methods of voting to election officials without election officials really having anything to judge them on, right? There's no, there's, there are no standards that um, these are being set against. There's no certification system. So at the end of the day, what you're left with is, um, you know, election officials basically having to rely on the representations of a vendor for which there's really no check. There's nothing to say um, what the vendor is telling you is true. Um, are there are there standards that they have satisfied? I think it's a real problem in this space. And I, I you know, I think most people agree whether they they think we're ready for internet voting or not, that um, we really need to have clear standards uh, before um, we come anywhere close to like having any significant number of people voting on these systems. That was something I was curious about as well. I would guess that the average person's understanding of these complex security systems um, is pretty low. And I can't imagine that every elections official really would be able to independently verify security either. Um, so what might those regulations look like? Like how do we bridge that gap to make sure that what is adopted if we do adopt these systems um, is actually secure? Well, you know, um, there, 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 there are some standards that were put out by um, the, the Overseas Voter Foundation in, in connection working with security experts. So there is some set of like independent standards out there. Frankly, I think, you know, if, if we're going to do this in the United States, it should be it should be something like NIST, the National Institute for Standards and Technology, um, which helps design um, the standards that we use uh, for voting machines uh, that are in place that put something like this together. But but you know, at the end of the day, it seems to me that there are at least three things that um, these standards need to satisfy. One is to ensure the privacy of the voter, right? Um, and it went through uh, uh, the steps that might be taken to authenticate the voter. Uh, but how do we ensure that their privacy is is protected? We have we have a secret ballot in the United States. That's one of the reasons that this is such a big security challenge, right? It's not like banking. We need to make sure that people can't buy or see see how other people are voting. Um, we need to ensure um, we need to, but we we still need to authenticate. So we can't have a system where uh, anybody can go in and vote for anybody. So that there's a, a bit of a tension there. And then, of course, uh, uh, probably most importantly, um, we, we need to ensure the integrity of that vote. We need to make sure that in every step of the process from, from the person's, when the person's um, trying to vote on their phone to when it arrives uh, at the election offices, um, that it actually represents um, the vote that the voter intended to cast uh, and somehow do that without, um, without the voter or anybody else, certainly anybody else being able to see and confirm with the voter that that was actually how they intended to vote. So those are complicated things to do. Yeah, and if I could, if I could add to that, I think I definitely agree about the, the problem about the standards that's something um, we've been advocating for for a while. Earlier this year, we actually published a paper, almost like an appeal to all the all the agencies to, to work on that. Um, but at the same time, I think the, the process of piloting and trialing the solution aids in that um, standards process, because in the past, there has been an active attempt, unfortunately, to prevent or delay the creation of, the, of such standards. So we definitely, I would you know, agree with, with Larry that that needs to be accelerated. And, and secondly, if you look at some of the, the piloting approaches, for example, the idea of remotely verifying the identity of a voter, which is one of the challenges outlined in the report, which Larry mentioned from, from a few years ago, that's actually been addressed based on standards which NIST has created. And so that's been successful in other industries. We've brought it to the election space. So, so there is work happening uh, bit by bit, you know, step by step manner, but with a formal standardization process, just like the one which exists for, you know, 
hardware in-person voting machines, that would definitely benefit the space and also, you know, help in controlling some of the, the chaos and the contradictory narratives which, which are out there. Speaking of those pilots, oh, sorry, Kevin, you wanted to jump in. I, I, no, you go ahead, you go ahead. I was going to ask, uh, speaking of those pilots, I'm wondering if we can go over um, some of those pilots that have happened recently and how they've gone. Um, I feel like Kevin has definitely reported on them. I don't know if that has anything to do with what you were about to jump in with, but. Well, sort of. I, I wanted to kind of note the trajectory that online voting has has had in the in the U.S. Uh, recently. Uh, you know, we've had a form. If you if you count facts as online voting for um, military and overseas voters, or uh, you know, in some areas you can. I think Nimit mentioned this uh, earlier. Uh, you know, there there are places it's not common, but where um, those voters can. Uh, send a uh, ballot as an email attachment. So technically that is voting online and it's existed for a while. But I think it's it's kind of important to note the trajectory recently where since uh, in, in recent years, there was sort of a surge, um, you know, West Virginia famously offered all its counties, uh, starting with the primaries uh, in, in the midterms to, to use votes. Uh, and there were a couple counties out West, which ended up prompting, uh, a couple months ago, several federal agencies uh, issuing a warning about online voting. And I think they only did that, well, I can say they only did that uh, because I've talked with some of the people, uh, the feds involved, uh, because they, they feared a more widespread adoption um, quickly. Now, there might be some disagreement whether uh, online voting can never happen or whether it's just a decade or so uh, before we can do so safely, but the the, the, the consensus there was that the, the, the feds were afraid of, of it being, uh, of it spreading any more than it had and warning uh, against more widespread adoption. Um, sorry, Jane, what, what was the, what was your kind of original question, if you, if you don't mind repeating that? Uh, I think Kevin helped answer that a bit. Um, just what the um, what those pilots have looked like and how they've gone. Um, but I guess to move on, I feel like we've been circling this question of um, security and trust. Um, and I imagine to really test whether any online voting platform truly works and is secure, um, researchers need to be able to independently test for vulnerabilities. Um, and I know that after the West Virginia trial in particular, votes face some criticism about that transparency. So I'm curious, what will it take to build more transparency? Um, I guess Kevin and Larry, from what you all have uh, seen, what might you recommend? And Nimit, are you all doing anything to, to try and um, improve that transparency? Sure. Um, so we, we've kind of been at the forefront. We were the first elections company to officially roll out a public bug bounty program. And, and the intention there was to kind of have some form of a formalized process where individuals and other entities who are you know, curious to, to do research and you know, provide constructive feedback would have a formal, formal method of doing that. One of the challenges which applies uniquely to this space is um, there's, there's the notion of, of a live infrastructure, which is being used as elections are happening. And then there is test or replica infrastructure, which mirrors the live infrastructure. And you know, the only difference is that it doesn't have live voters on it. And so that's essentially been our appeal to the community that um, use the test system, don't try and um, do disruptive activities on a live system because on a live system, if uh, any disruptive activity happens, we have to treat it as hostile. And that's essentially what happened in the incident you were alluding to, where uh, it's not possible for the system to know the you know, good intention or bad intention of somebody who's trying to do something malicious. And that would, you know, get reported to the customer and then it's up to the customer to do whatever they want. And so um, that's, that's something which, um, which has been a source of contention, but we feel um, 
there's there's a lot of information out there about about the system there's uh, test platforms available and so there's ample opportunity for uh, individuals and organizations to do constructive research uh, and aid the aid the process uh, in a constructive manner rather than you know attempting to stop or derail the process Larry, do you want to <laughs> jump in? Or, or, or I, I can. You can go ahead. Um, I, I do think it's uh, it, it's worth pointing out um, in, in terms of this bug bounty that a uh, uh, the FBI opened an investigation into a, uh, as I've reported, a University of Michigan um, uh, student who was looking into, uh, was researching vote security. Um, and votes did have a bug bounty program at the time, but only after the investigation started, uh, updated the, the terms on Hacker One to uh, include that uh, it's prohibited to use. Uh, uh, or to, to, to target or to look at a, a, a quote live election system. That's that's not correct, and we've pointed that out numerous it's, times. It's it's, it's archived. It's internet archived. It's there's it there's history the of terms. It. Uh, the published terms. There was clarification posted, but the test system information has been there from the very beginning, and um, this was a live election, and an attempt was made to disrupt a live election. The system caught that attempt, reported it to the customer, as you would expect a normal system to do. And beyond that is not, not in our control. And so if, um, if someone does not want to follow the guidelines, then uh, it's, it's not something we can control. Our duty is towards our customer. Our duty is to make sure that the system remains you know, safe from all attempts and threats. And so if, if you try to tamper with a live election system, then the system has all, you know, all rights to fight back. I don't think it's controversial to, to say, um, you know, for, for the, your, your terms to say um, that, uh, uh, you know, no tampering with a live election system. I, I think that's, that's uh, understandable. I, but I, I do think it's, it's worth noting that that those were not the published terms at the time that the student was referred to the FBI. I just want to add that's that's not not accurate. It, it literally and is. This news was reported <laughs> one year after the attempt happened. I do want to hear what Larry has to say about this, and I see he's gone off mute, so I assume. That he has <laughs> well, you know, I, I mean, my only, my only thought is that it's. Um, I, I have a problem with using a system on uh, during a live election and then using that as an excuse for. Um, for uh, not a allowing more openness and, and testing of the system. So I, 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 my thought would be like, may maybe we shouldn't be using the system in a live election yet. Um, we, we, sh we, should, uh, we should, you know, I, I know for instance, in Washington DC, they, they tested the system without using it first in a live election, then they decided to withdraw um, after finding that there were, there were problems with it. So, um, I, 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 I think, unfortunately, that we've got things a little bit backward um, when we're talking about using these systems. Just, just to you know, add to that, this is, this is not the first time the system was used. There were close to 50 elections the system had already been used in. And so exactly following the, the prescription you, you described, Larry, um, it was never an intention of anybody to, you know, use an untested system on a live election. It's gone through a series of, you know, smaller elections and, you know, in an iterative manner. And that, that's the whole notion of pilots, that if we don't do these small, calibrated, well-designed pilots in the, in the real environment, in the real field, then the process of learning is, you know, significantly innovated. And each of these pilots, they've been significant learnings on, on multiple fronts. And so our appeal is that that process needs to continue. That process needs to be supported because not everything can be tested in a lab. 
And until we keep doing this process, until we support this process, we'll never, you know, reach reach a better state. Aside from learning, I think that there have been quite a few criticisms of the current online voting systems, the security, um, and just generally whether we're ready to implement this technology. I guess I'm curious to hear um, what you all make of this process. Um, I'm imagining that as an average consumer reads the news and sees uh, these systems being rolled out and the security issues with them, I wonder if that decreases overall public trust in these systems and if there's anything that we can be doing to try and repair that over time. Well, so my view is that we shouldn't be using them <laughs> at this time. So, uh, and it, you know, as, as Kevin mentioned, I mean, there's, there really is near universal um, uh, uh, agreement among security experts that we are not ready to be using these systems in live elections, whether it's the, the, um, the, the FBI, CISA, NIST, EAC, a warning that was put out with really unusually blunt language uh, this year, or the National Academy of Sciences report, um, many others basically saying that we're not ready to do this. So, uh, you know, I, I'm always concerned about voter confidence um, and about scaring voters unnecessarily. Um, but, you know, my own view is like at this time, we're not ready to be ha using these systems in live elections. So I, I don't think we're ready to repair um, confidence because we shouldn't be. I think what we should be doing um, is uh, setting up some kind of national standards first, uh, vetting these systems. Um, bug bounty program is a great idea, but I, you know, not, not for, for use in actual elections where we're putting um, the actual votes of citizens at risk. So there's something, firstly, a few different things there. Actually, wherever this technology is being piloted, it's an improvement over the existing system. What's the existing option for the uh, deployed military voters, citizens overseas, and uh, voters with disabilities? Email or fax. So those are not exactly the top of the line security systems out there. And so this system is whether you agree with, you know, you should do online voting or not, incrementally and significantly safer than that. And so that's one reason. The other reason is, as we've discussed earlier, not everybody has an opportunity to vote using the traditional system. So what we are saying here is let's just ignore those group of voters, however small or big they may be. And that's, that's I think that's unfair. Technology is here, it's been, slowly piloted and you know tested in various different scenarios and wherever it's the, the risk profile is is adequate i think we need to use it we need to help the voters vote and then the the question of that there is near universal um, agreement that these systems should never be used or are not safe enough i think that's that's not true there are lots of um, people who are security practitioners for uh, large amounts of time who have been working in you know different aspects of, of our you know industries and the technology to make this safe is here it's it's being used in different aspects we're just bringing it here um, and it, it's being tested in a in a thoughtful graduated manner so I, I don't think we should just assume that it's not, not possible or it's never gonna be possible. And regarding the media narrative and you know, the, the element of public trust, I think, um, and I would kind of put, put this on Kevin uh, since he represents the media here, that a lot of times the media doesn't have the nuance of you know, reporting these things in a manner which you know, give uh, people a balanced opinion if, if a theoretical vulnerability is detected in a system, it does not mean that your vote is going to get compromised. And CISA actually put out a document this week on how you know, such theoretical vulnerabilities exist in the traditional system and those should not be misinterpreted. So I, I think the, the folks in the media 
should also, I would say, look at, look at that aspect of, you know, how some of these new technology uh, nuances are, are reported, because that, that can also play a, a constructive role in, you know, educating the people that, you know, how, what really is, you know, important here. It's, it's not, we shouldn't be fear mongering, but at the same time, we should, you know, present the facts to the people. So from what I've seen of Kevin's reporting, I know that he has talked with many experts um, about this um, and that is a reporter's job. I guess I'm curious to hear Kevin's response to that. Yeah, I mean, I think a lot of cybersecurity reporting um, can overemphasize sometimes danger at the expense of um, realistic use of a system. Uh, that said, there's really not any both sides here. There's a National Academy of Scientists report. There is uh, the peer-reviewed MIT report. There is the joint assessment of four government agencies. Uh, the, just the consensus that, uh, that there are too many potential vulnerabilities. There's not uh, enough guaranteed ways to ensure security to conduct an election online. I mean, it, the consensus is, is absolutely near unanimous. There's I, I cannot in good faith as a reporter uh, try to present them as equally valid ideas. It's that simple. Jen, I, I just want to add, I mean, I don't want to speak for Kevin, but I, I certainly wouldn't say that um, internet voting is never possible, and I didn't mean to imply that. Uh, but, I, but I also don't think that, um, you know, saying that uh, there are challenges for um, voters with disabilities or, or uh, voters who are overseas, or that there are um, some systems that maybe are not as secure as we, we would like, um, means that we should have systems that security experts are warning are not secure being used in live elections. It's a little bit like, you know, there, there are people, unfortunately, in, in the United States who have trouble getting uh, medicine or drugs that they need. I don't, I, I don't think there are too many people who would argue that we should have a market for um, drugs uh, that that um, that where the, that are not approved by the FDA that should be sold to people um, for use um, with no regulation and no testing. And essentially, that's what you know we're saying here. We're using systems um, where there there are no standards and there is no independent authority um, that is testing to ensure that they're secure. What we have is. Um, vendors who are, who are saying that it's secure. Um, and I, I don't think that's enough for, for a live election. I think since, since, you, since you brought the aspect of, um, part of the aspect of medicines, I would, I'm sure you, um, we all know of the, the whole idea of clinical trials, how, how critical that is before a medicine is approved or not. And what's essentially happening um, in Those the are regular. pilots we are doing are essentially the same. They are analogous. It's a small group of people. These, have, these voters have been carefully selected. The risks have been analyzed and a determination has been made that, you know, and these people have volunteered to, to participate and have been given an array of options uh, to vote and they, they pick this option. And so I think we need to keep that in perspective. Um, and you know the idea of standards is 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 something I totally agree. We we've been pushing that, but we should also not forget that there's been an actual attempt to delay or prevent the creation of standards um, by the very people who criticize um, the whole idea of uh, you know mobile or online voting. So let's let's keep that in perspective as well. And at the end of the day, I think we need to keep the voters needs upfront. Um, there are voters out there who are benefiting from this technology. They may be a very small group of people, but we need to keep their interests top of heart. And you know, elections in this country are, you know, technology is produced primarily by the private sector. And you know, the private sector is, is leading that path of innovation and pushing this technology so that you know, more people have access, standards get created, and you know, there, there needs to be more collaboration on that front. And, and lastly, I would say, you know, you pointed out 
some of the Kevin pointed out some of the reports. Many of those reports use data which is 10 years old. I mean, the whole idea of remote identity proofing, the secure elements which are available on the smartphones, those were not even considered when those reports were written. So let's be realistic. Let's look at the, you know, the cutting edge security technology which's out there, which is actually being used by the military in other areas, which is being used by the other industries. And so let's let's keep in uh, sort of an open open focus there. Uh, on that as well. But that's not the extent of what these reports are. They are, they are robust and, and, and comprehensive. But they are using um, technology paradigms, which are many of them are outdated. They don't- But they're looking at account. your app, which has only been around for a few years. Yes, but it takes into account NIST standards for remote identity proofing, something which has been successfully used uh, for, for a decade in other, other industries and has been proven to be safe and safe and secure. So I don't think you are comparing, you know, apples with apples over here. It's, uh, it's- But that's uh, not the only complex, issue complex they system. found. I'm not, not exactly sure what, what you're referring to, but the whole idea of using, you know, theoretical, um, conjecture without actually, you know, using the system. I mean, the system is being used in 70 plus elections. Every attempt to break into the system has been blocked, detected, and thwarted. Uh, it has been thoroughly audited. 30, more than 35% of voters. Sorry to cut in, but I do want to leave some time here for some of the um, attendee questions. Um, so, Nimit, I know you had talked about how this uh, votes makes voting accessible to some folks who might otherwise have worse options. Um, we actually have a question from Mia Armstrong that's kind of the converse question, which is what can we, what could be done uh, to make online voting accessible to folks who don't have access to tech devices um, and or are unfamiliar with technology? That's a great question, uh, Mia. So um, one of the jurisdictions we work with has been pioneering the idea of, of curbside voting. And so they've, um, they've adapted this technology to essentially an iPad. And so the iPad is actually brought to the voter. And so if you are a voter with a disability, you can request accommodation. An election official will bring the iPad to your home. And then you can, in the privacy of your home, they, they train you. And then you can privately mark your ballot. Similarly, if you're a disabled voter, you could, you know, drive up to the, the county office and they'll bring, the, bring the, the iPad to your parking area. And so the whole idea of uh, using technology for curbside voting. So that's something which is being actively piloted by, by a jurisdiction with the focus of you know, helping voters who may not be tech savvy, who may not have a personal smartphone, but still could use the, the great accessibility functions which you know Apple has added to to iPads and you know Google has added and Samsung have added to, to their their devices. So that's, yeah, that's but it sounds example. great for folks who maybe live in a city and have access to you know officials. But I'm imagining you know there are folks who live in rural areas or folks who don't have internet access. Um, is that how how will that be resolved? That's definitely um, a very uh, important aspect as well. So one of the one of the pilot projects which is ha happening in that front is the, you know, process of maybe getting satellite connectivity, uh, satellite internet connectivity to some of these remote locations, and then having a shared device. And this is um, being proposed for some of the Native American um, jurisdictions where they have um, traditionally very difficult access to, to the postal system. And so that's one option that's been proposed. Similarly, you know, internet, uh, other forms of internet access using microwave technology is also being, being piloted in some areas. So definitely that's, that's a challenge need, that needs addressing, uh, but there are you know, attempts being made to bring more access, especially getting broadband access to, to rural and inaccessible areas. Another question. Um, 
curious to hear from all three of you on this. Um, does including blockchain technology in the idea of online voting solve any of the security concerns, or is it just adding a layer of potential failure in the system? I am positive that Nimit is going to disagree with the sentiment. So we'll just go ahead and lay that out there. Um, I have, again, my, my role here is, is a journalist. I, I, I talk to the security experts. Um, I'm not a technologist myself. I have never found an election technologist who found that that addresses any of the significant, like the, the fundamental uh, issues with online voting. Um, it just, it's, it's, it's cool as a, as a ledger, but doesn't address the fundamental issues uh, of, of software based online voting. So um, to address that, um, I think a lot of that comes from a basic misunderstanding of the system. So I'd try and lay it out very, very simply. The blockchain is not solving all the problems here. It's not a cure for everything. It's a solution we've used as part of a multi-pillared solution to solve some specific problems. And the problems are, one is resiliency. It is unlike a traditional centralized architecture which suffers from single points of failure. Right now, we have 64 nodes running in our network. And so it's incredibly hard for somebody to disrupt that network. So it adds resiliency, um, given that it's, it's no longer a centralized system, but a distributed system. Number two, it, for the first time, lets citizens audit their vote. So just as you may remember from the earlier description, any citizen now, once they voted, can go into the system, audit their vote confidentially without revealing to anybody else how they voted. And then similarly, an auditor, a group of citizens, all of us here could then independently audit an election using the blockchain without actually you know, knowing how somebody voted. Um, and so those are you know, some small um, um, advantages of, of using the system. As we said, it's not, not a cure for everything. It helps resilience, it helps secure the aggregate board, and it helps provide this end-to-end uh, -end audit capability, which you know, a traditional system doesn't have. Could you do this without the blockchain? Yes, that's possible if somebody uh, figures out a way to do it. Um, you know, it's definitely feasible, but we haven't found a way to do these things in a manner that's reliable without using this technology. And that's why we are you know, piloting and testing it as part of our wider solution. So in these last couple of minutes, I just want to give uh, Kevin and Larry a chance to, is there anything that we haven't touched on um, or any final thoughts you have to share? Look, um, uh, my, my only final thoughts are um, <laughs> that, you know, the security risks are very seriously. Um, uh, we, We've got uh, all of the intelligence uh, agencies, um, bipartisan um, uh, intelligence committees in both the Senate and, uh, and the House, um, warning that um, the threat of nation states um, attacking our elections is real. Um, and so, uh, you know, I, I do not discount the possibility that we'll, we will one day be able to have um, internet voting that is secure, but um, I, I think what Kevin says is correct, that any independent um, security expert says that there's still a lot of challenges that we have to overcome before we can do so securely. And given how important our elections are um, and how important trust in those elections is, um, it's essential that um, before uh, we start using these systems in um, and actual elections that we have national standards and that there's, there, there's, there's both national standards for, um, for um, what those systems have to satisfy, um, uh, testing, uh, a testing system for those systems. Um, and and um, all of that should be happening before um, 
we're using them in, in actual elections. Uh, I think we've we've touched on all all the, the major um, points. I think it's important to highlight um, how difficult it is to audit uh, an election in, in general um, or uh, to, to, to do a cybersecurity audit on an election system. So for instance, we did not know publicly until the Mueller report that the GRU, part of its 2016 interference campaign was uh, that it had hacked one, though, as we've since learned, uh, two Florida counties. We didn't know until last year, uh, we didn't get a, a full audit of um, the e poll book failure that some speculated was maybe hackers uh, report did not find evidence of that before there was a, a federal report into that. Um, the, the incident was in, sorry, the incident was in 2016. Uh, the, the audit was not until last year. Uh, so those things take a lot of time. Um, and uh, again, we are talking about uh, states have so little time to certify an election that we would not likely be able to tell um, exactly what went wrong if something were to go, go wrong until it's way too late. And that's the main reason when somebody says, you know, uh, I can bank online, why can't I vote online? That's the main fundamental difference is, uh, you know, banks can, can a hold a little bit of um, can have an acceptable level of loss, which they do. Banks are you know, have see hacking attempts every minute, um, and then also the uh, you know you can reverse charges and you you can't really reverse a vote. Well, thank you all three of you for joining us today. Um, I also just wanted to remind folks that next week's event is with the Free Speech Project um, and it's on if we need a First Amendment 2.0. Um, and that is at 11.30 a.m. Um, Eastern time rather than the usual noon time. Um, but thank you all again for joining us, all of you, um, and have a great rest of your day.